This morning we come to our final sermon in our Advent series this year as we've been thinking about the Christmas story of hope. And we have looked at several different aspects and been reminded that it's essential in this day and age for us uh, not simply to begin with the story of Jesus Christ because most people don't have a context into which to make the giving of Christ joyful. And so we need to really begin at the beginning where the trouble was, where the fall was, where evil came into the world and disrupted all of God's intentions and plans for His people. And then we'll begin to understand the glory and the wonder and the majesty of God sending His Son for us rebellious sinners that Christ would come and take our place. On this fourth uh, sermon in this series, we're actually going to look at two texts, two verses. One from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 53. So if you'll find that in your Bibles, and then you'll find the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 32. And if you'll stand, we're going to read these two verses of Scripture, Isaiah 53. Of course, Isaiah 53 is that great commentary on the suffering of Messiah. And the capsule verse of it all perhaps is found at verse 10, our focus this morning. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. While standing, look at Romans chapter 8. Some have called Romans chapter 8 a soft pillow for a tired heart. It's a beautiful passage, chapter of Scripture. We're going to look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And so ends the reading of God's holy word. Let me pray. And Father, may your word be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher. In your greater glory, our supreme concern, through Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I mentioned that uh, the genesis of this particular series um, came from some readings in Paul trip where he was reminding me of the importance of telling the whole story of Christ, not simply jumping in at the person of Christ. And so we have been thinking about the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ during Advent. And we didn't start, as he suggested, with the baby in the manger, but rather in this world, in the story of Christ that's rooted in the grief of the heart of God and a grief that's connected to the grief in your own heart. For God has set eternity in the hearts of all human beings. And that's why there is this longing within people for something that transcends them, something that is bigger than them. And all the joys and the glories of this world can't fill that void. 
And so that grief in your heart is connected with the grief that God experienced in his heart when all of humanity was given over to evil. Well, God heard your cry as well as the cries of humanity and ultimately responded in the sending of his Son. We looked at that announcement last week as we heard the angels declare glory to God in the highest and on earth peace with those whom God is pleased And we indicated that that was not merely an announcement of a birth. It was also a prediction of a death. Now, interestingly, this story of the coming of Messiah that we've been considering throughout the Advent season is not only connected with the grief in the heart of God, but it's connected especially to pleasure in the heart of God. Now, when you get that, and you understand that, it will change the way you think about this story of the coming Messiah. That verse that we read is one of those says it all verses. It's a really good translation that we read from in the English Standard Version. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. And yet, if you were able to look at the original language that lays behind that word will in the Hebrew tongue, you would understand something much clearer and stronger and more of pathos than the word will communicates. Some translations picks it up. The old King James does, for instance, where it reads... It pleased the Lord to crush him. It (coughs) pleased the Lord to crush him. Now, Now try to get your mind around and your heart open to the radical thing that God is communicating through His Word. How, (coughs) pardon me, how could it be that God the Father would ever find pleasure in the crushing and the grief of His Son? Now that's what this verse really communicates. It's the idea that's behind the word that's, uh, uh, co- that's translated will for us. Now, the original language is there to stop us up short. It's meant to arrest us in its reading. It's meant to cause us to ask how, why, What? I mean, for just a moment, think, many of you are parents. Think for a moment with me. Think of the heart that you have for your children. Parents, you know. You know the fear that you have for your own children. You know the hurt that you have for your children and that you would literally do everything you can to protect your children from danger. You repeat constantly the same warnings over and over and over again and again so that they might be able to avoid many of the dangers that lie out there. And you do that because you love them. 
and you want to keep them from any danger. You pray that their lives will be free of difficulty, that, that God would give them success. You, you never would want anything like what is described in this passage in Isaiah 53 to ever happen to one of your children. And rightly so. That's, that's the heart of a parent. But we have to look at this passage and we have to ask, what could be so powerful? What could be so motivating in the heart of God that he would be willing, he would even be, he would even find pleasure in subjecting his beloved son to this horrible thing. What could be in the heart of God that would allow him to do that? And the answer, plain and simple, is love. Magnificent, faithful, joyous, redeeming love. Love for his people. And we know that. For instance, that Beloved verse, John 3.16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Thank you. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal Life. God so loved you, the world, that he would be willing to do this radical thing, to give his son over. God looked at the broken world. He, he looked down in time eternal, and, and he looked at side of you, broken, separated from him, and he was moved with compassion and love and so full of grace that he was not willing that any of his should perish and remain in that state of eternal condemnation. Dear friend, that's holy love. And because of the nature of sin and of evil, we were not able to do anything to escape this dilemma that gripped all of our hearts. We were enslaved. We were blind. We were dead in sin. But God acted on our behalf. He so loved the world that he gave. No, no, no. By using that word, please, don't misunderstand God. God doesn't find pleasure in those moments of the suffering of his beloved son. No, the word pleasure in that language uh, it communicates not what uh, we think of suggesting some sense of enjoyment in our understanding, but that word pleasure indicates that he pleasured in the results that Christ giving would provide. In other words, it's a word of purpose. It is a word that communicates the will of God. But that word please indicates 
What God took delight in was what be, would be resulted as a gift of Christ. God purposed the servant's death, a death making possible an offering of sin for divine forgiveness. That's the bottom line. That's the story of a magnificent love. And I want to say it again and again, it's a love that we could never achieve or earn or deserve. It must be a gracious gift. God loved us this much that he would be willing to subject his son to unthinkable things. Why? Because that one death would give life to many. There's the plan. Now some of you are thinking, Wayne, I know that. You talk about that regularly. Why, why rehearse that again this morning when our minds are everywhere else for Christmas? Because you need to hear this. Perhaps not right this very moment, some of you, you think. But maybe next week or next month or sometime in the next year, in some circumstance, some situation, some relationship, you're going to be tempted to doubt God's love for you. Maybe it will be a moment of physical suffering and you wonder why God has allowed this pain to overcome your body and be your experience. Maybe it'll be in the midst of a very significant relational disappointment. Somebody that you love greatly has turned their back on you and you wonder why God has brought this into your life. Or maybe it's in a moment of financial difficulty. You've sought to obey God. You've sought to be a good steward of all the resources that God has provided you. But for no reason of your own, you've lost your job and it doesn't make any sense and you're about to lose your home and on and on. Or maybe you just look around the world that you live in and you look at all the evil that seems to be prospering and you wonder, where is God in this? Where is His love? Well, friend, mark these passages down because this is the place to run. Because not only does the giving of Christ argue for the magnificence of God's love for you, his people, but it also argues for the continuance of God's love for you. That's why we read from Romans 8, 32, that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Do you hear Paul's logic? Do you hear the argument Paul is making? If God would do this most radical thing of offering his son to a cruel suffering and death for you, now notice Isaiah said it pleased the Lord to crush him to put him to grief, not only physical suffering, but emotional suffering. Now Paul is arguing if God would subject Christ willingly in that way for us, then, then won't he? 
Won't he give us everything else we need for life? I mean, it wouldn't make any sense, would it? For God to do a radical thing like that and then turn his back on you in the moment of your need. That would make no logic whatsoever. And so Paul argues that your guarantee that God will be faithful with you and in you and for you and meet all of your needs as you walk through life towards eternity, your guarantee of that is the cross that he gave his son to. And if God did this for you, then friend, he will meet all of your needs. All. No questions. Now, just a minute though. You are Westerners, and so am I. And we've grown up with a lot of abundance. And I'm afraid we've loaded down this word need with wish. God nowhere signs off on our wish list. But God does sign off on our need list. Your Creator knows what you need. And He is totally committed to meet all of those needs. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to stay up at night losing sleep playing those what if games. You don't have to try to figure out uh, the sovereignty of God. There are moments in life just quite simply when God will confuse you. If you don't believe that, read the Bible. The Psalms are full of those moments. Psalmist, holy men of God writing God's word. And they pin things like Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Sometimes it's confusing the things that God has brought into our lives. And dear friend, your heart will never find rest. You'll never find the peace that passes all understanding. You'll never know the calm of a heart trusting God or the security that God offers by trying to understand what God is doing in your life. Because quite frankly, there are things that God will do in your life that you will not understand this side of eternity. That's why Tim Keller used to argue that the importance of believing in the sovereignty of God is not that that doctrine will make life make sense to you. No. The importance of believing in the sovereignty, the supreme authority of God, is precisely because life won't make sense to you. And so, by resting in the complete sovereignty of God, you have a place to run and hide your heart. You have an argument to give back to yourself in those moments when it doesn't seem like God is hearing, when he seems distant, when you're confused about what he's bringing into your life, when you're looking at someone else and their life looks so much easier and so much better and the enemy whispers in your ear, where is your God now? Dear friend, you have an argument to answer back to those fleeting thoughts in your mind and you can trust that your God is sovereign and he will meet all of your 
needs. So perhaps you've not fully understood the implications of Christmas morning. It is the ultimate demonstration of the faithful love of God. And so when you rise tomorrow morning and you have that time with your family around a tree or however you celebrate Christmas, pause and revel for a few moments in that amazing love of God that He one day in time past sent His beloved Son to a manger so that He would go to the cross because it pleased the Lord to put him to death for you. That was the plan. You see, a second Adam had to come. The first Adam had failed the test, and a second Adam had to come. Jesus was that second Adam, and he had to be willing to live in the middle of the harsh realities and the temptations of the fallen world. And he had to be willing to be obedient in every way, in every thought, in every desire, in every word, and in every action. And he must be be obedient as he goes to the cross. He is the perfect Lamb of God who can now carry our sins, who can satisfy the wrath of God so that we might receive the forgiveness of God, be accepted into the family of God, have the righteousness of God given to us through Jesus Christ, and on top of all of that, to have life eternal. That was the plan. We had a problem we could not solve. It was called sin. And you cannot escape it in yourself. You can't defeat it. You can't redeem the world from its fallenness. You must be rescued. That's why the promise of a Savior is so precious. That's why the angels were proclaiming glory to God in the highest. That's why we sing joy to the world. And so from day one, that little baby was destined to die. Listen, the cross, the cross isn't a moment of defeat. The cross is not an interruption. The cross of Jesus Christ was the plan. Jesus was born to be the lamb. He came to be the offering that would finally satisfy the wrath of God's anger. And so as Isaiah says, for this result, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. That's why the pleasure, because in one cruel death, life would be given to many. There would be a great worldwide family of every language group and of every location of the globe and of every period of history who would be given new life through the death of God's beloved Son that He would have offspring like the sands along the sea. What a plan. One death, an innumerable, unnumberable lives given, and he shall prolong his days. 
there in Isaiah a hint of the resurrection. Jesus' death wasn't the end of the story. He would live on. So friend, I don't know what hardships you're facing. I don't know what grief may be in your heart. I don't know the temptations you all struggle with. But I do know that you will be tempted to wonder where God is and what he's doing. I do know that there's an enemy who would whisper in your ear, where is your God now? You've obeyed for this? Is this what he's rewarding you with? Where is that thing called grace? Where is his power? Then you take Isaiah 53 in one hand. You take Romans 8 in the other. And you argue back with those fleeting doubts. For God's love is magnificent. It is faithful. It's powerful. It's so willing that he would be pleased to give his son to cruel suffering and cruel death so that you could know life. And if God was willing to do that for you, is it conceivable that he would abandon you in your moment of need? Absolutely not. And so, the rest your heart longs for is provided with God's word. You may not understand what's going on. You may not, can't comprehend why things are happening in a swirl in your family. But this you can know. God's love is for you. It's with you. And it's in you. And dear friend, if you have come to rest your heart in him, that love for you is forever. And I, I, I must say, this is not a universal love. So if you are one who is rebellious and wants nothing to do with God, you only show up here for good manners or because someone's twisted your ear or whatever the case may be, Friend, don't deceive yourself that you have God's love. Only those hearts that are willing to bow to God and confess, I am a sinner in need of mercy. Because if your heart isn't for Christ, then, dear friend, those cruel things heaped on Christ for his people are placed on those who are not for Christ. But the good news is this morning, your heart can be changed, you can be turned. If during this time you felt yourself wanting to cry out, I wish I had that, then dear friend, talk with us. We'd love to share with you how you can know that for yourself. But if you walk out of here just as high-handed in rebellion and distrust and disobedience, don't imagine that love is for you at this point. It can be. Look to Jesus and be saved. Let's pray.
Lord, in this world of darkness and sin, where things don't operate that the way you intended as the Creator. There are moments of confusion for us, moments where it doesn't feel like we're experiencing your promises. We even wonder at times if you're present. In those moments, the enemy whispers words of doubt and dismay. We pray, O oh God, in those moments you make us strong in the faithfulness of your love. Hide us in the shadow of your wing. That if you gave your son to be crushed for our redemption, it makes no sense whatsoever that you would abandon us along the way. And so may we run to you and not from you. In Christ we pray. Amen.